In the year 1160, Japan's two greatest clans fought a war of annihilation. The leader of the Taira clan gathered his soldiers to hunt down his bitter rival, the Minamoto. Few of the Minamoto survived, not even their chief. His young sons, Yoritomo and Yoshitsune, escaped. They swore to take up the sword and avenge their father. They would follow the path of honor or death, the way of the samurai. There is a way of bringing up the child of a samurai. From the time of infancy, one should encourage bravery. If a person is affected by cowardice, as a child, it remains a lifetime scar. The boys Yoritomo and Yoshitsune were born into a samurai family and a way of life ruled by honor. For the boys, the shame of living under the same sky as the man who killed their father was too much to bear. They were bound to seek vengeance. They would follow Bushido, the way of the warrior. The samurai were a class apart, professional warriors born to fight. The very word means to serve, a samurai placed himself in the care of a lord. In return, the warrior pledged to his master his life. Obeying orders without pause, he would know no other life than to train and fight for the leader of his clan. Being a retainer is nothing other than being a supporter of one's lord, entrusting matters of good and evil to him and renouncing self-interest. Only 6% of the Japanese were samurai, and they intermarried to maintain their privileged stock. Over the centuries, from bands of landowning warriors scattered across Japan, the clans of samurai evolved. Yoritomo and Yoshitsune were born into the powerful clan of the Minamoto. By the 12th century, many clans had become great armies and mortal rivals. Japan was at ceaseless war with itself. Yoritomo and Yoshitsune began to learn the way of the samurai. The warrior's closest ally was his horse. The boys first learned to master it. Once they rode with confidence, the younger Yoshitsune was placed in the care of a master who taught him archery. The samurai bow was sturdily made of strips of bamboo bound with rattan. Six to seven feet long, it was held one-third up from the base, so it could be easily maneuvered.
Yoshitsune marveled as his elder brother and the other young samurai combined the skills they had learned. Destined to lead the Minamoto, the brothers were now separated for their safety and sent away to finish their training for war. Samurai were trained in the arts of sojutsu and naginata, the long spear and the halberd. ultimate skill of the samurai was Kenjutsu, the art of swordsmanship. The samurai valued his sword above all else, so much that in time it became the symbol of his soul. craftsman was more esteemed than the swordsman. His profession was more religion than craft. He dressed like a priest and purified himself before purifying his steel. A hard steel sheath encased a softer core, making the sword stronger yet more flexible than any of its day. The blade would be beaten ground and polished to the sharpest edge known to man. Every swing of the sledge, every plunge into water, every friction on the grindstone was a religious act. The samurai carried his sword in a finely lacquered scabbard. When he drew the brilliantly polished blade, light shone in waves all along it. Its cold blade, collecting on its surface the moment it is drawn the vapors of the atmosphere. Its immaculate texture, flashing light of bluish hue, its matchless edge upon which histories and possibilities hang. It was made to kill a man with one blow. Then, with a flick of the wrist, the warrior would shake off the blood of his enemy. The young samurai would learn where a man was weakest. A cut to the side of the throat would sever the jugular and kill within three or four seconds. A slash to the wrists, kidneys, or armpit a little longer. The samurai's life was like the cherry blossoms, beautiful and brief. For him, as for the flower, Death followed naturally, gloriously. The way of the samurai is found in death. Every day when one's body and mind are at peace, one should meditate upon being ripped apart by arrows, spears and swords. And every day without fail, one should consider himself as dead. No samurai sought death, but all trained to accept it and numbed their hearts to fear. Before battle, the samurai prayed. Through the secret rituals of Buddhism, 
he entered a state of divine strength. It is said that on the battlefield, if he wills himself and day and night hopes to strike down a powerful enemy, he will grow indefatigable and fierce of heart and will manifest his courage. Yoshitsune's page dressed him for battle. His elegant armor was strong yet light, made of overlapping strips of iron, lacquered for protection against rain, and bound with bright silken cords so he could move freely. He wore iron shin guards and arm guards and bearskin boots. His head was protected by an iron-plated helmet bearing an elaborate neck guard. For nearly two decades, Yoshitsune had trained for the chance to avenge his father. Now, once again, the Taira and the Minamoto would clash. Both sides followed the strict rituals of samurai warfare. The riders charged by turns and vied to announce their names. Their shouts and yells awoke echoes in the mountains. I am Kajiwara Heizo, a Minamoto warrior worth a thousand men. If anyone here considers himself my equal, let him kill me and display my head to his chief. After a day of bloody fighting, the Tyra retreated to their boats. Fastening a fan to a mast, they taunted the Minamoto to strike it with a single arrow. Yoshitsune summoned a young warrior famed for his archery. The honor of the clan was in the young samurai's hands. He rode out into the rough sea and closed his eyes in silent prayer. Hail, great Bodhisattva Hachiman, and the gods of my progress. Vouchsafe that I may hit the center of that fan. If I miss, I will smash my bow and kill myself. In answer to his prayers, the sea will come. All watched in silence. He notched his arrow and steadied his breathing. Then he took aim and fired. The arrow flew straight to the fan, thudded into it and cut it loose. For a time, the fan fluttered in the air. Then it fell abruptly towards the sea. As it floated on the waves, the skill of the samurai was honored by loud cheers from both armies. For five years, the fighting between the clans wore on. In 1184, Yoshitsune reached a Taira stronghold and a turning point. At Ichinotani, he launched his most daring assault. Dominating the shoreline, backed by a treacherous cliff, the fortress was thought invincible. With a handful of trusted men, Yoshitsune rode up to the outcrop overlooking the castle. Far below them, 
the sound of a flute drifted up on the wind. The Tyra suspected nothing. Some listened to the music, a passion of this cultured clan. Others passed the time by playing an ancient board game, Go. From his vantage, Yoshitsune decided to test the precipitous route by sending riderless horses down the cliff. Some of the horses broke their legs and fell. Others descended in safety. Three of them reached the roof and stood there, trembling. Where horses alone could go, Yoshitsune decided, so could riders. Now the renowned horsemanship of his men would be put to the test. He galloped forward at the head of 30 horsemen, and all the others followed, descending a slope so steep that the rear rider's stirrups touched the front rider's helmets. The tense riders went down with their eyes closed, encouraging their horses in muffled voices. Yoshitsune signaled his warriors down by the shore, the wealthy mounted on horseback, the others on foot. They launched their attack. In the rear, Yoshitsune and 30 riders stormed into the castle. The Tyra warriors turned to face the real danger. Too late. They raised a great battle cry, and great numbers of panic-stricken Tyra warriors galloped into the sea to save themselves. A Minamoto warrior by the name of Nozone gave chase. He saw a lone rider splash into the sea. Nozone rode up alongside him, gripped with all his strength, crashed with him to the ground. He pushed aside his helmet to cut off his head. He was 16 years old, a boy just the age of Nazane's own son. Tucked into his belt was a flute. This was the boy who just hours before had played so sweetly. I would spare you, he said, holding back his tears. For there are Minamoto warriors everywhere. You cannot escape. It is better if I kill you than another for I will offer prayers for you. Tears pouring from his eyes, Nazone steeled himself and sliced off the boy's head with one clean blow. After battle, each samurai gathered his trophies, the heads of the vanquished. Their faces were washed, their hair combed, and the heads laid out with labels naming both slain and slayer, so the lord of the clan could inspect them. Those who brought back the heads of renowned enemies were lavished with titles and estates for their valor. Months after the victory at Ichinotani, the Taira clan was finally crushed. 
24 years after their father's murder, the brothers had their revenge. Yoritomo, the leader of the victorious Minamoto, was raised to Shogun, supreme military ruler of Japan. For his brother, Yoshitsune, the joy of victory was cut short. His bravery in battle had made him popular and made the Shogun jealous. Yoritomo issued his own brother's death warrant. Since boyhood, every warrior was prepared for the final self-sacrifice, a ritual permitted to no one but a samurai, seppuku. Through it, a warrior could atone for an act of disgrace. Yoshitsune sought only to preserve his honor. Better to die by one's own sword than be hunted down like an animal. There is but one resolute path for the warrior to take. It is that of death. Yoshitsune's page brought him a last drink of sake. Then he presented him with a short sword, its blade wrapped in silk to soak up his blood. For a moment, he seemed to collect his thoughts for the last time. And then, stabbing himself deeply below the waist on the left side, he drew the dirk slowly across to the right side, and turning it in the wound, gave a slight cut upwards. He never moved a muscle on his face. He uttered no sound. In the 13th century, the samurai embraced a strand of Buddhism known as Zen. Like all Buddhism, Zen forbade the taking of life. Yet many samurai were drawn to it, for it took them to another world. For warriors daily facing death, Zen was a comforting faith. Many samurai who survived into old age became Buddhist monks. As late as 1867, Japan would be ruled by samurai families. Yet the seeds of their decline were sown long before. In the middle of the 16th century, Portuguese traders introduced the nemesis of the samurai, firearms. In 1575 at Nagashino Castle, the Takeda clan for the first time braved musket fire. The gun proved mightier than the sword. Thousands of samurai were slain. That day, the rituals of samurai warfare were shattered. The classical age of the warrior was dead. 
The sound of the Gion Shoja bells echoes the impermanence of all things. The color of the Sala flowers reveals the truth that the prosperous must decline. The proud do not endure. They are like a dream on a spring night. The mighty fall at last. They are as dust before the wind. In ancient India, one creature was both a god and a weapon. For one king, these beasts were the shock troops of an army as organized as any before or since. Riding a juggernaut, these soldiers carved out one of the largest empires in history. A great army of soldiers and elephants has proven unstoppable. But in the year 260 BC, they face their worst enemy, distance. Victory lies first in reaching the battlefield intact, a battle all its own. The outcome will decide the fate of a kingdom. After a century of conquest, the Mauryan Empire stretches across most of India. The new king, Ashoka, gazes from his balcony, master of all that he sees and much more beyond. But it's not enough. He wants the rest of India and summons his troops. Across the water from the capital, Pataliputra, a young archer answers the call to war. Like him, most recruits come willingly, except the most important. to stand at least 10 feet tall, they must have intelligence, loyalty, and hides like iron. There are no volunteers. Each must be drafted. A pit is dug, then covered in branches. The trap is sprung. battle that looms, hundreds of these beasts will decide the outcome. The Mauryan army, 2,200 years ago, was as well organized as any that came before it or after. The chain of command was well forged. The manuals of war governed the least detail. Nothing was left to chance if a rule could be thought of to cover it. Day and night, the army's scribes drew up battle plans to be delivered to Ashoka for his review. Six soldiers encircle and protect a horseman. Five horsemen encircle a war elephant. Yet so disciplined is this army 
that when it charges, it charges as one. The young warrior knows exactly where he will fight, on one of the lead elephants. The thought fills him not with fear, but pride, just as the army was not a choice, but a birthright. Like his father and his father's father, he belongs to the Satria, the warrior caste. They are born to fight. Every morning, the army's elephants are brought out of the city to be watered and fed. Unlike the warrior, they weren't born to fight, but now have no choice. Life is cheap in Ashoka's realm, but some lives are cheaper than others. Any man who causes the death of an elephant is executed. As a Mauryan scribe records, they are the foundation of Ashoka's army. A king relies on elephants for achieving victory in battles. With their very large bodies, they are able to do things in war which are dangerous for other arms of the forces. Marching in front, destroying ramparts, gates and towers. Trampling the enemy's army and causing terror. The young soldier is well paid for his skills, skills that are tapped only rarely. He spends most of his time training or waiting or enjoying the privileges of army life. They have the greatest freedom and the most spirit. They practice military pursuits only. Their weapons are forged for them. When there is need to go to war, they go to war. But in times of peace, they make merry. And they receive so much pay from the community that they can easily support others from their salaries. The privileged life is interrupted by the king's summons. It's time for them to earn their keep. The men of Ashoka's army now train relentlessly, just as the manuals of war dictate. Infantry, cavalry, chariots and elephants shall have their training outside the city every day at sunrise except days of conjunction of the planets. The king shall take a personal interest in the training and make frequent inspections. On this day in 260 BC, the king has a special interest in the training. He has declared war on the rich kingdom of Kalinga. From its position on the Bay of Bengal, Kalinga controls the trade routes to southern India and beyond. It is also the last great obstacle to controlling India. Kalinga is defended by its own army, with its own elephants. For Ashoka, who owns 8,000, victory will be his only if he can get his men and beasts to Kalinga to fight. If he arrives with his army intact, victory is assured. 
Before leaving, Ashoka arms his soldiers to the teeth. Across the city, munitions factories pour out thousands of swords, shields, daggers, bows and arrows. Stables, the elephants are also made ready for the campaign ahead. Each one, 11,000 pounds of war machinery, oiled, watered, fed, and inspected. like a river south toward Kalinga. A general takes the lead, then the emperor himself, flanked by bodyguards. Behind him march thousands of elephants, horses, oxen, and soldiers. Then the part-time militia, craftsmen more skilled in carpentry or bakery than in soldiery. Then the companies of allies and mercenaries. Behind them finally roll thousands of wagons, loaded with equipment and food to keep this vast horde alive. see the head or tail of the column. To the rest of the soldiers, it seems endless. Ashoka's troops must cover 500 miles before they reach Kalinga. Fortunately, the highways are as well planned as the army. Roads are the arteries of the Mauryan Empire, and Ashoka has decreed that they be lined with ponds and wells. Without them, the army would perish in days. Along the route, Mauryan villages support the supply train for their own good. By feeding the soldiers, the villagers protect themselves from a common crime of the day, robbery by their own troops. The elephants are a bigger problem. 
Weighing three to five tons, they need 500 pounds of fodder a day. Again, Ashoka is prepared. Hundreds of tons of hay lie stockpiled along the route. The road south is well kept. The army manages up to 20 miles a day. Yet at times, the terrain seems as great an enemy as the Kalinga. Engineers and laborers forge ahead, repairing boats, fords, and bridges. Sometimes the elephants themselves form a living bridge. At the end of each day, warriors and beasts rest. None knows when the march will end and the battle begin. They can only march, eat, sleep, and wait. After weeks of marching, the Mauryan army enters the kingdom of Kalinga. A Mauryan spy races back with news for the king. Unexpectedly, men and beasts are halted. The soldiers wonder at the delay. Until word comes down the line, the enemy has been spotted. Prepare for battle. The Mauryan king, Ashoka, has already won the first battle, the Battle of Logistics. He has managed to march his army intact into enemy territory. Now comes the second round. Will his soldiers hold their positions? More important will the elephants. If they do, the Kalingans will be checkmated before they know it. If not, it may be Ashoka who is cornered. Some soldiers are protected by woolen coats or chain mail, but most wear nothing but a loincloth and a turban. At the front line, Ashoka's elite, the archers mount their transports. The war elephant carries three fighting men, of whom two shoot from the side and one shoots from behind. There is also a fourth man who guides the animal. The 
heaviest elephants hold the front line. The smaller guard the rear. Any beast known to be bad-tempered fights on the flanks. Here it will do the least harm should it go berserk. Everyone knows his place. The following shall be stationed in the rear. Physicians with surgical instruments, equipment, oils and bandages, women with cooked food and beverages, and women to encourage the men to fight. Warriors go into battle certain of their own fate, if not the armies. If they must die today, they will reach heaven. Like distant thunder, the enemy are heard long before they appear. At a command, the Morian line advances. The best of the infantry fight in front, just behind the elephants. The second best at the rear. The poorest fighters are sandwiched in the middle, where they can't run away. All are ordered to shout the name Ashoka, both for courage and to identify friend from foe in the chaos of battle. The warrior's bamboo bow is as long as he is tall. From his vantage point, he fires. He tries to steady his aim, even as his platform surges beneath him, rolling over the enemy. are worn down by sheer numbers. Against so many war elephants, the Kalingans are defenseless. Some are tossed in the air, others crushed underfoot. The rest panic and run. The Kalingan king is checkmated. Victory is Ashoka's. With its army beaten, all Kalinga soon surrenders. Not all of Ashoka's men will return home. The dead are mourned by their comrades. Even, it is noted, by the elephants. Some of them have been known, when the drivers perished in battle, to have caught them up and carried them away, others have stood over them and protected them. Emperor Ashoka is shocked at the bloodshed on both sides. Victorious, he can afford to turn to a way of peace and thus assures himself a place in history as the first king to follow Buddhism. He erects stone tablets throughout his empire with the lessons of conquest. The beloved of the gods, Ashoka, conquered Kalinga. 150,000 people were deported, 100,000 killed, and many times that perished. The slaughter, death, and deportation of the people is extremely grievous. The beloved of the gods wishes that all beings should be unharmed, self-controlled, calm in mind, and gentle. India had grown to a size it had never known, 
and wouldn't know again for 2,000 years. When Ashoka died, no one could take his place. With none to lead it, his great empire collapsed under its own weight.